Hi everyone and welcome to the Cybersecurity Sauna. My name is Janne Kauhanen and I will be your sauna majori and the host of this podcast. Thank you for joining us for another session where we sweat out the hot topics in security. Welcome to our all listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at Cybersauna. Many organizations fail to effectively combat current threats due to their inability to adapt or progress. As a result, they rely on outdated processes, procedures and third-party services. And this prevents them from taking advantage of the advanced capabilities, tools and approaches available to defensive security professionals these days. However, the time an attacker spends on a network before attempting to achieve their objective is decreasing rapidly, making many typical detection and response solutions ineffective. Speed is the key, but unfortunately the gap between detection and response is growing. So today we're joined by threat hunter Jojo O'Gorman and principal incident response consultant Mehmet Sermeli to discuss what we can do to solve these challenges. So guys, what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about detection and response gap? What does that mean? So I think uh, basically what we mean when we're referring to this detection and response gap is so the time difference between an organization or an individual becoming aware of an of an incident, so detecting or being alerted to an incident, the time from that point to the point in time when there's kind of been effective response and remediation of that incident. And that time difference is kind of growing and it's a real issue kind of across the industry for many reasons. I think it's it's almost made worse by the fact that the average dwell time, so the time that an attacker kind of the time from when an attacker is on the network to actioning their objectives, that time's also decreasing. So what may have been a period of a few weeks or months, you know, in previous years can now be as little as a few days before they're kind of actioning like destructive objectives. So it can have a massive impact on organizations. So the impact is basically that where, you know, a couple of years ago, we, we had some time between when the attackers first landed on the network and before any damage, real damage was done these days, not so much. Yeah, exactly. Every kind of minute that we're slow to respond, an attacker has perhaps been on the network for some time and is already enacting kind of those more destructive actions. And kind of the longer we leave it, the more likely there's kind of risk to higher value assets. Mm. So just to jump in in there, I think there was a very good research released three years ago from uh, Deloitte, and they calculated the cost of a campaign, a malicious campaign against organizations, right? And they found a single ransomware campaign, which can target hundreds of organizations, right? Costs them $2,000 roughly. Mm -hmm. And that was the high estimate, I think, for them. So what that uh, like tells you is that a threat actor launches an attack which costs them $2,000. And if they get five organizations, effectively, they need to work through as fast as possible so they, they get more return on investment, right? right? What they're running is a business model. So what we're seeing is like the interesting trend is like initially when we started seeing incidents, the threat actors would take their time and would try to cause the most impact, um, even if it means they getting out of their playbooks. But now we're seeing more and more threat actors purely sticking the playbooks. If the damage or the impact is limited, they are fine with that. Okay. My understanding is that we're also seeing uh, the actual cyber attacks getting more complex in their delivery and, and more frequent, certainly. So... What impact does this have on the uh, detection and response gap? I can certainly talk from from my perspective in as a threat hunter, you know, with the kind of increased complexity, we have to employ much more advanced detection capability. Mm. And with that, you know, we're kind of bringing in more data, more telemetry, and that is going to increase kind of the amount of um, false positives with that. And it can result in analysts kind of experiencing alert fatigue just the kind of sheer quantity of of real time alerts they have to respond to, as well as working on you know kind of true positive incidents back to back, um, it can have a real effect on the way analysts work. And I think you know to kind of combat that, we need to have an equal amount of of research into 
decreasing those false positive alerts um, to make our analyst time more, most effective. Yes. So that was going to be my next question is, is uh, you know, if, if the detection is getting sort of harder and more time consuming, and on the other hand, attackers are spending less time on the network before they pull the trigger, it seems like we're unable to sort of keep up. So what are the what what are the things we need to do to be more effective in, in catching these attacks in their early stages, as we know, is, is crucial? So I think I, I can like kind of jump in in there because uh, as incident response team, we work with a wide range of organizations. Some some use uh, EDR products, some has no security. You know, they, they all, all kind of organizations that are in different place in their cybersecurity journey. Now, one of the things that's kind of critical is the people who have the maturity or the budgets to afford the EDR products, they're not too far back. Mm. Because uh, the reality is that the complexity and frequency is not that threat actors using more, you know, advanced malware is that is the fact that they are moving away from malware unless it's absolutely necessary to use. Because the mo- the malware, for example, you use a payload on one one uh, one attack, it gets burned. Every organization knows about mm. it, but with the valid credentials or uh, technologies that are specific to that organization, if you get caught using that, it doesn't help the others. Like they, they, that's specific to that organization. And the reality is that if you don't have an EDR technology, you're not able to track these wallet usage or like the binaries that are on your estate that's being misused by the threat actors. So obviously EDR helps, but let's say you a customer or a company that cannot afford DDR, which is, which is possible. Like, you know, it's everyone has a different business model, different needs and different budget, budgetary availability. So the, the biggest problem that we're seeing is the definition confusion around cyber events and uh, incidents. Now, what do we mean by cyber event? There is a very good definition of this, to be honest, in the NIST, uh, Incident management, uh, incident handling guide. However, I'll try to stumble through it. Uh, what I think of it is a cyber event uh, to me is a AV product or a firewall doing its job. It's detecting malicious attempt. Now, not every malicious attempt is successful. That's your AV product or security controls doing its job, right? But, uh, as incident is that threat actor has hit your controls. And eventually succeeded and progressing, right? So how do you separate a cyber event from an incident? So how do you? And that's, that's, that's the part where the layered detection comes mm. in. So a lot of the EDR vendors or MDR store providers like ourselves have already built that successfully. So what does that mean is that every detection we see on an endpoint or node, we increase the threat score of that endpoint. And if it hits a t- certain threshold, we say, okay, this validates the requirement or need for our analysis to actually inspect because we're seeing too many anomalies. Now, certain detections obviously have higher scores due to the, you know, where they are in the cyber kill chain. Uh, a good example is, for example, a malicious Word document getting detected. That's at the beginning of the attack. And if that was detected, likely it was stopped. That does not has have a as high score. But if you see a credential dumping tool being detected, that's later in the chain. That would mean a threat actor has access. And that's an incident. There is a benefit to implementing this model. And that is you remove the alert fatigue and the need for your analysis to constantly looking at different AV alerts and playing playbooks that might mean just taking notes. You don't really need to do that. The, the cybersecurity products, AV products are doing that, right? Yeah. So in our business, if we, if we're called onto an incident, first thing we do is we review all the security tools yeah. because that will have captured the most basic information to give us some sense of what's happening. And then if further investigation needed, then we start, you know, running uh, either response job or doing forensic collection. So, sorry, you're you're touching on a lot of things here that I want to sort of drill deeper into. Um, starting with the fact that you know, if the time gap is as narrow as it is, then sort of the real time component, getting that information, like accurate information, getting all the information when you need, it seems crucial to yeah. me. 
Are we good at that at the moment as an industry? Is there anything sort of where you feel that it would be like, do we need more information or do we have the information that we need? I think it depends from organization to organization. So in my mind, there is three different organizations. There is an organization that does all of their security in-house. There is an organization that does a certain part of it, a hybrid model that certain parts of it themselves and outsource certain escalations. And there is fully outsourced. Now, if you have fully outsourced and you have a repeatable vendor like us, <laughs> but uh, a vendor that ha- runs an MDR service uh, through their uh, EDR agent, you're likely in a very good space because uh, the agents are designed to actually listen to the other uh, security products and see what they're detecting. So an example is like if your AV is detects something, we actually uh, increase the scoring. Uh, Jojo definitely can talk more onto that uh, if you're interested. But um, as an industry, I think the knowledge is like the understanding of this is quite scarce. Uh, most organizations uh, implement or buy multiple security tools and the data is across multiple portals. So when we get cold incidents, Regularly, we will have to ask for access to multiple platforms mm. and the client will say, actually, we cannot give you access. It'll take a few weeks. And then that's when we start saying, okay, can you export the data? And not every product is actually good with that. So we might sometimes end up, you know, asking them to share screen while we take notes of what's their security tool and has done. Um, I mean, there is worst case scenarios where people don't even um, centralized like network appliance logs, like firewall logs mm. or VPN logs. They're just sitting at the endpoint. So um, it, it's it's funny that we keep coming to the basic, but yeah. uh, this central centralizing of the security logs is critical. And so, you know, if you can do this with a single VDR product or an MDR service, it's great. But if you if you can't, then you might need to host your central SIM, and it's um, yeah, it, it really like the answer really depends on what type of organizations uh, mm. we're talking about. So what about you, Jojo, when you're doing threat hunts, are you happy with sort of the, the kinds of information, the amount of information that's available to you? Or do you wish that you, we could know more about something? I think there's certainly as we get kind of threat actors using kind of more complex and like technically complex techniques, then there will be kind of new telemetry that we will require but i think on the whole you know having the data is really great and important but it's about how you use that and effectively use it something that we try to do in the selection and response team is kind of continually improve our detection capability but also assess whether um, the, the kind of feasibility with some of the the rule engineering that we're doing so say particular rules have been producing false positives too much you kind of need to constantly assess whether your the kind of intelligence you're getting from your data is actually meaningful mm. because it's, otherwise it can be overwhelming and you end up with, yeah, like we've mentioned, kind of analysts having to do kind of more repetitive, um, false positive closing out incidents where you're seeing kind of the amount of data is having this negative effect on accurate identification of threats. So how much of that can we then automate? Because it seems to me that if the tasks are repetitive and, and require sort of you getting it right every single time, that seems like a textbook case for, for automation, especially as we are trying to sort of be faster. Yeah, I think this is a, a massive thing um, in terms of decreasing that detection and response gap. I think automation is, well, already pretty vital. And if not now, then it will be in the future just because of the sheer amount of data that we're now working with it's kind of become unrealistic for analysts to just be doing this on their own. And I think if we can automate something and it makes sense to, then we should be. And I think it's got a number of benefits, I think, kind of in two main areas. Firstly, that it will, you know, literally decrease that time between detection and response if we can automate kind of those kind of an initial steps in our investigation so that you kind of giving analysts a head start, whether it's kind of pulling back files or artifacts you know, all those those smaller kind of repetitive tasks, if we can automate that, then we're gonna we're gonna straight away decrease the amount of time it takes to respond to that incident. There is a there is a step in between. Obviously like automating response requires a considerable amount of 
a technology that enables your analysis. But there is a step in between, which is actually empowering your analysis to do something when they think is something's happening. So, Jojo, can you talk about like the pre-authorization maybe that the, our like clients provide us with? Yeah, so one of the things that we have for, for each of our clients is this kind of pre-agreement on whether we have, we're authorized to take actions, kind of both investigative and destructive actions for remediation tasks and response tasks. So we're kind of empowered to basically take action depending on the severity of an incident. If we think, okay, um, we've seen some suspicious or malicious activity, we need to block these domains or remove these files straight away. We're actually given the responsibility and, and entrusted with that straight away. And it means that it's going to decrease the amount of time that an attacker is on the network if we if we don't have to go through all those kind of like procedural bureaucratic right. steps. If we're just trusted straight away to kind of, we've seen the data, we know that it's malicious and we're going to go straight away and, and remediate as, as soon as we see it, then that's obviously going to decrease that, that gap. So you're just moving the decision making sort of closer to where the rubber meets the road, empowering people to make the calls with the information they have at their disposal. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I can see that being valuable in, in threat hunting. Is that something that happens in incident response as well? Yeah, absolutely. So a good example of it would be under attack scenarios where mm. we get a client in and based on the initial call, we're certain they have a hands-on attacker and we deploy our agent. And when that happens, actually, the, the approach we take is that the IR consultants manage the agent and we will have a conversation with the uh, client to say, hey, look, uh, we think we need to start, uh, you know, containment on X, X, uh, X time, like maybe in two hours, three hours. Following that, we will continue, uh, you know, removing any signs of activity while we're reporting on what we're performing. So it definitely like, you know, automation sounds nice. Yeah. But it's really hard to just jump from, you know, zero, like manual to automated. There needs to be a, a step. And that's, that is this moving the decision and empowering analysis to do that. And I, I think one of the fun, fundamental challenges also is that you, your security operations needs to be set up to be enable you to do that. Yeah. So a good example is that the, the, the way the threat hunting model that we are applying within our organization is not applied everywhere. So if we get an incident uh, on our NDR servers, Jojo picks up the ticket and Jojo will handle that ticket to closure. Mm. So she is the lead on it. But a lot of organizations employ the tiered model where yeah. we have a SOC 1 analysis, which has a list of playbooks that they can follow. And if it doesn't fit to that, they escalate it to SOC 2. And SOC 2 doesn't know what to do to it, escalate to SOC 3. And actually, so much information gets lost and gets repeated in between those handovers. We had a recent uh, incident come to our incident response team, actually. And the reality of it was that the incident was detected two months ago. This client used uh, third-party uh, vendors to handle their initial detections. Yeah. So the third party would uh, get the detection. They had a tiered SOC model. They would escalate to the second person. Second person would go, oh, I actually don't know if this is legit. Let's escalate. Uh, let's hand it over to the IT team to investigate. They pass it on to the IT team. IT team goes, I don't understand what's happening. This is not normal. Pass it back to the SOC. And we saw there was at least 25 tickets relating to this incident that they got handed over back and forth so many times that they, they were all closed without justification. So at the end, the, cl uh, the client had to client notice the issue. Mm. And that's when they actually properly, you know, got it to investigate. But this handover of people is also a major issue. And if you have an incident handing over from people, then who do you empower the yeah. authority, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, now, I, I like what you're saying about empowering people to make decisions, but also there's a trend these days to put AI in absolutely everything, and it feels to me like there might be room for AI, like legit use cases for AI in, in this sort of thing with the tooling and the sort of decision-making 
or at least advising human professionals in their work. Is that is that true in your 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 respective fields of work? I think it hasn't hit IR yet. I mean, it has through the EDR right. agents and our own agent. But I think Jojo can talk about, for example, um, the machine learning te- technology that we utilize in our detection stack. Yeah, so we have a number of different ML models that we that we utilize. One of the kind of more recent ones and interesting ones in terms of automation as well, we have a machine learning model that basically classifies every real-time alert we get in terms of how likely it is to be a true positive alert or false positive. And this model is so good that we're now able to actually um, automate the suppression of real-time alerts that are really likely to be false positive. And it just means that we can decrease the amount of false positive alerts that come to um, our analysts. And it's kind of a step in the right direction in terms of if we can try and decrease the time that an analyst spends on each alert or decrease the amount of alerts they have to to investigate, you know, within a shift, then it just suddenly free up all this time that your analyst can be spent on doing the kind of more strategic or complex tasks that kind of require human judgment or expertise. Um, So I think we can definitely utilize it to kind of empower our analysts to be doing those kind of more, perhaps the more proactive threat hunting or like least frequency analysis or long form research ideas that are kind of the things that are really going to ultimately decrease that gap as well. Um, we can certainly utilize machine learning and automation to do that. I think it's it's also critical to say that the, the, the detection and response team is able to support these initiatives. Like when we're talking about the long strategic research, we're talking about the exact machine learning AI or automated responsive uh, response tasks, right? Because the analysis is the best person to determine the uh, best reaction. But if they don't even have time to think about that, it's it's impossible okay. to get to that automated response because the people who would actually build that automation is busy dealing with Ronald Mills security uh, cyber events that shouldn't be incident. No, I get that. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, sounds like it is a hairy problem. Sounds like we really need to get on, get on closing this gap between detection and response. So, to our CISO listeners, what's your advice? How should organizations uh, be handling these things? How do you, how do you close that gap? From my perspective, I think the reality is that we are able to build reliable machine learning, you know, algorithms because our data set is vast mm. over multiple clients, right? If you're a small organization, utilizing machine learning is not going to be very possible unless you buy a product that incorporates it. So from the perspective of small organizations that won't have the data to implement these, we recommend investing in a good product. Mm -hmm. So I think my advice to most organizations would be to have a good endpoint agent and centralize uh, and a separate AV product. And you want the, you want your EDR product to be obviously hooked into that AV to be able to listen to it. So it can alert you as well. So like centralizing that. That's the, that's the most simple way. Okay. As, as you go for, like if you have more budget and you're able to afford MDR services, I think the reality of the thing is as soon as there is a new campaign, we, we generally see uh, the signs of it or build detections for it within a few days. Um, so when we see it in real life, uh, an MDR provider deals with it a lot faster than anyone else uh, would because we have already dealt with it, seen with it, or researched it. A good example is one of the other like strategical and tactical tasks that the DRT does is whenever there is a new uh, TI uh, drops on a campaign or a new malware is found on virus total, we actually check how do we perform against this malware on our estate. Like if it hit to one of our clients, can we respond to it and can be detected appropriately? Is there any fine tuning we can do? So this is only possible if you have that time. And this value comes with obviously the MDR, uh, like MDR providers. Mm. Depending on your budget, the MDR is, may not be your solution. It might be too expensive, but I think at base minimum, make sure you have an AV that centrally reports the, you know, detections. And try to get an EDR product. There is a lot of different EDR products. They, they're at different capability, but there is, there are, you know, 
sort of ones that, that are, you know, they would be very cheap to get. It'd be very easy to operate and it will, it will still do the job. If there was a big incident, our incident team, response team can come in and use that product to help you. Without it, you're, you're absolutely blind because we're now getting into like territory of like major incident. If a threat actor has been in your network for one month, and you have no telemetry, nothing to tell us the history of where they've come come from. We have to resort to digital forensics, which will require data collection, data transfer. We have to process that data. Mm-hmm. The response gap increases hugely. Like the estate visibility yeah. is the most critical thing, the most basic thing that you need to close that gap. See, that's the thing you were talking earlier about how you need access to multiple t- tools these days. How do you feel about setting up sort of break glass accounts, sort of accounts that already have the accesses in place. And now when there's an incident, you just hand over one of those to the responders. Again, I think this this would depend on the level of trust you, you give your people, right? Mm. So if we have, for example, in a retainer model, you might be not willing to give these uh, strong accounts to the externals mm. that might be able to perform. So there are different models, right? So you can create forensic accounts that can actually read and download log data mm-hmm. or able to view your EDR telemetry. Um, that's the, that's the most basic. Or if your organization is able to effectively. So we, ha- we had a recent incident where the client said we, it could, it would take us weeks to get your account. Uh, but we had in incidents where clients were able to give us accounts within 30 minutes. Right. So it depends on your organization's ability to maneuver. So if they are able to create accounts within 30 minutes sure. and you yeah. have access, then it's not a massive critical need to have these accounts to be ready to be used. I got you. But if you know that it'll take weeks to get some uh, responders access to critical data, then it's probably something that you should look into. And the model of how you do it, is it like read-only account or is it uh, an account that can do response as well? That depends on, uh, you know, your business. How, how comfortable is your business giving that uh, access to the responders? All right. Okay. Uh, so, Jojo, what's your advice on, on clients? How, how can they make your life easier? I think one of the things that we've kind of mentioned already, when I think in terms of like our most successful clients, in terms of how quickly they are to respond and react to incidents, are usually the, those that know exactly who is responsible for what, and they're very quick to kind of provide um, useful information when it's required. You know, as an example, when we raise an incident um, to a customer, we've had it in the past where they're unable to identify who this host belongs to, who's responsible for it, how to to remediate actions on that host because they can't even find it on the network. Um, And I think that's exactly what we want to avoid. We're going to decrease that gap if, if we've got good visibility and an understanding of our assets and who's responsible for them. Right. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Yeah. This sounds, I think like AI and machine learning, these are all things that we try to strive towards. But I think in reality is like the asset inventory mm. is one of the requirements of uh, ISO. And we still have organizations today yeah. that don't have that asset inventory. And What's funny is that let's say you finished your investigation and you know what the containment is that you need to isolate one of these hosts. If you don't know the, who owns that asset, you actually don't know the business impact. Uh-huh. But that might be the key server to all of your business. And Jojo here is able to issue a response to task that is isolated. But you, as a business, you don't know what the impact is. Yeah. So you, you're not able to authorize it. Or it takes you more time. I, I keep saying it, but if, depending on where your journey is, the actions that you need to take changes. And honestly, the uh, cyber hygiene actions, such as having an asset inventory, having good c- monitoring, you know, and not just monitoring a certain part of your network, but everywhere. Like these are the basic stuff that will help you close that gap. And as you get more mature, I recommend for every organization to have a almost cyber partner. In the, it, it's a, a company that you kind of work with. You can, you know, consult with them to say, Hey, this is where we're going in cyber strategy. What do you, do you think? Do you agree? Like, do you think our priority is correct? It's just not getting that check is crucial. I'm a real advocate for collaboration. And I think, you know, we talked about moving away from this kind of tiered SOC model 
and kind of empowering our people to work incidents kind of end to end and getting exposure to kind of every step of or every step of that playbook and remediation right through to to kind of the resolution of an incident i think it's really good to kind of foster collaboration kind of within your team and within the, all those stages but also beyond that something we well i'm lucky to have in, in the drt and at with secure is i often will work on um incident response cases with with consultants like Matt or i've worked with red team consultants and doing kind of offensive security herbal team cell tests and we work really closely with threat intelligence and i think giving your analysts exposure to kind of different areas not only does it build them kind of better professional skills but having exposure to to all of those aspects of kind of defense is only going to build you a better capability and i think you know even if you kind of whether that's like your in-house security or collaboration with teams kind of third parties if you've got good kind of communication and knowledge sharing between those then that's kind of going to help decrease that detection and response gap because you've got all those communication channels there you can, you you can kind of get involved at every stage of the incident even if it's not kind of being directly handled by a particular person you can kind of have visibility and get involved with something if you kind of want exposure to that makes sense to me hey I want to thank you guys for being with us today and then talking us through this this topic our oh, pleasure pleasure thanks for having us that was the show for today i hope you enjoyed it please get in touch with us through twitter with the hashtag #cybersauna with your feedback comments and ideas Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe.